So today we're in the book of Genesis. We are looking at uh, the second half of chapter six. We also look at chapter seven, chapter seven, eight, and nine. This is the story of Noah and the flood, a story that is known to many of you. Very interesting and very dramatic. And um, I wonder whether when we look at this, we think we're reading scripture or we're just reading fiction. A story was told of a young girl who was in Sunday school, and the Sunday school teacher that day was teaching on Genesis, teaching about creation, and the teacher's point was that God made everything, and the teacher starts dramatizing and said he made everything, you know, the sea, the mountains, the fish, the birds, the everything, the plants, and made us. God made everything. And then um, the Girl asks, yeah, but did he make everything like in everything in the world? The teacher said, yes, he made everything. The little girl holds on a bit and then later puts up her hand and says, teacher, if God made everything, then why do all my toys say made in China? <laughs> so what's your comeback? <laughs> How do you respond <laughs> to that one? <laughs> So, you know, thank God for our Sunday school teachers. They've got some <laughs> tough jobs to do sometimes. You know, I want to say something like, you know, well, God made the people in China and God made the stuff that they use to make your toys and so on. So God did make everything. And so when you look at Genesis and when we hear the wonder and the majesty of the creation story, or when you look at everything that God did in and through the flood, we need to realize we're reading history and not just a fanciful story. This is not a fairy tale. We're reading facts. And we're reading things that are not just available to us through the natural, but things that have been revealed to us by God himself. Because God spoke through the prophets and the writers of the Bible, and those things were then written down in Scripture. So we're talking about revealed truth. truth. So we must expect some things to be beyond our imagination, some things to blow our mind. That is proof, indeed, that God is the author. If it was everything that, if you could figure out everything, you begin to suspect whether God is really behind this. The Scripture says that as high as uh, God's ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our, our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are God's thoughts above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. So we need to come to scripture with a posture of humility and ask God to surprise us with his truth and accept his truth on the basis of faith. We saw in the, our series that we're not talking here about blind faith. Our faith has substance. It has some ballast underneath it. What are we told in Hebrews 11.1? 1? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There's something solid there. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the certain conviction of things not seen. And by the way, when the Bible talks about hope, it's not kind of the hope we talk about where we say, cross our fingers, or I hope this is going to happen. You know, I hope, like it may happen, it may not. The biblical hope is actually certain conviction. It is just not yet fulfilled. Why do we say that? Because it has been declared by an all-powerful, all-sovereign, and almighty God. So as we prepare to come to this story, we need to come with that right posture in our minds. And you know, if you have a problem with the story of Genesis. The people who don't even believe that Adam was a real historical person. The people who think he was a myth. If you believe Adam was a myth, you have a problem because Jesus then was also a myth. Jesus, if you look in the genealogies in the book of Matthew or even in Luke, his genealogy, his lineage is traced all the way back to Adam. You cannot have a real historical person who came from a mythological figure. You have a problem with Adam, you've got a problem with Jesus being real. You've got a problem with Adam, you have a problem with the resurrection. What does 1 Corinthians 15 tell us? Adam brought death into this world. Through Adam, death came. 
For since death came through a man, that is the man Adam, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man, that is Jesus Christ. Verse 22 there says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. You have a problem with Adam, you've got a problem with the resurrection. As important a doctrine as the resurrection rests on the historicity of Adam. You've got a problem with the Bible and what it says in the book of Genesis. You've got a problem with the cross and redemption. Paul writing to the Romans in Romans 5 says, if through the sin of one man death reigned, how much more will we reign in life through the righteousness of one man, Jesus Christ? Again, we believe we inherit sin from Adam as a human race. We then inherit salvation through the righteousness of Christ by being aligned with Christ through the redemption he brought. If you've got a problem with Noah, who we're studying today, you've got a problem with Jesus' return. Jesus explaining and preaching about his return and trying to tell people that his return is a sure and certain fact. He actually bases it on the flood and on Noah, saying as sure as you know from your history as the Israelites that Noah and the flood happened, you can be equally sure that my return is also going to happen. What does he say in Matthew? He says about that day, about his return, the day of his return, or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. He draws a direct parallel. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. People will be busy enjoying, eating, giving in marriage and so on, and then the Son of Man will come suddenly. What happened in Noah's time, Jesus said, is exactly what's going to happen at my return. So, we believe by the eyes of faith, everything we see here to be true. Where are we now in our journey through the book of Genesis? Remember where we ended last week. We ended in Genesis 6. Through Genesis 6, 5, we saw some of the most tragic passages in all of scripture. Genesis 6, 5, God looked and saw that every intention and thought of man's heart was always continually towards evil. Everything had become evil, every thought of their heart. The world was filled with violence. And then it says in Genesis 6, 6, God regretted that he had ever made man. He then goes on to say that he was then going to destroy the entire world. And that is where we now come to in um, our study today. God says, however, I am going to spare one man and his family. That man was called Noah. Why was he saved? Because scripture says Noah was found to be righteous and blameless in his generation. Righteous means he was right in his standing with God and right in his standing with fellow man. Righteousness is not a religious term, it's a relational term. It means right relationship. God looks at you and says, everything you're doing is right. God looks at you and says, your relationship with your fellow man is also right. No wonder in 2 Peter, Peter refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. Everything he was doing through his acts and through his words was about righteousness. And God says, yes, because of your righteousness, your right standing with me and your rightness with other people, I am going to save you. Remember when Jesus was teaching and summarized the law and he was asked, uh, what is the summary of the law? And he said, yeah, that, um, you know, love the Lord your God with all your um, um, strength, heart, soul, and mind. Yeah, and then the second command he said is, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then what else, did he, what did he go on to say after that? He said, all the law and the prophets rest on these two commands. He was summarizing and saying, basically, everything in the law and the prophets is about rightness with God and rightness with man. That's a summary. Ab um, um, Noah was found to fit the bill, and then he 
is therefore saved. If you think about Noah, he's a guy who must have gone through a lot. And as you think about, as we read this passage, think about the, first of all, the, um, the way in which he must have become a laughing stock. When he was building this big ship on dry land, God told him something and said, build a ship. And there's no storm in sight. It's estimated that it actually took Noah over 100 years to build the ship. Or Noah, by the way, he lived you know, to 915 years. By 500, age 500, you're still having children. Um, <laughs> I'm not giving any suggestions, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the, the flood came in his 601st year. But here was a man who took long, building the ship. Just imagine what people must have said as he comes back. Still building that ship, no? It's looking rather big. Press on, don't give up. You will need a big rainstorm to float that boat. They come back year after year after year, but he's, tre he's treading on. Just imagine the scorn he was put under. In chapter 6, we are given the dimensions. We're given the instruction. We're told that it was about 400 meters, 450 meters um, long. This was roughly, uh, you may say it's about one and a half times the length of a football pitch and about half the width of a football pitch. It had a lower, a middle, and an upper deck. And he had to build it according to God's preci uh, uh, precise instructions. He was told to make it out of cypress wood, which he does. He was told to, to, to coat it with tar on the inside and on the outside to make it waterproof. He does all that. Some of you might be asking questions, and these questions have been asked about Noah and the ark. How did he fit thousands of birds and, and animals onto that ship, onto that uh, um, uh, big ship? How did he feed his family and the animals? It's estimated that all the time considered both the preparation, uh, um, um, the, the, the time he, they got onto the boat, the couple of days uh, before the rain started pouring, the time the rain poured, and the time it took for the waters to recede was actually 364 days. It was really a full year. How did he feed them for a year? We must also imagine and let our imagination go a bit, um, exercise our imagination. Have any of you thought about the sanitation challenges that might have been aboard that, that boat. Just imagine, animals and people in a fairly tight space for a year, and they couldn't get out because the door was shut and they couldn't. What were the, I'd, I'd be interested to ask him about how he managed that one when we see Noah in heaven. Just tell me first of all, I believe this is true, but you know what? How did you figure out sanitation? <laughs> Where did the water come from? And where did the water go to after that? And so on and so on. These were pairs on the ship, yeah? Male and female of every kind and so on. And seven pairs of the clean kind. Again, our imagination. Was there any mating on the ship? <laughs> I mean, that's just me saying. <laughs> I mean, so there are many questions. And this is partly why people wonder whether this is real story or fiction. But we are told this is how God brought about redemption in his plan of salvation for us. So today then, we now move to where this brings us in our reading, and this is in Genesis chapter 7. So I want us to look at uh, Genesis 7, and we'll begin reading from the beginning. Genesis chapter 7. <clears throat> starting from verse 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a, pair, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every, kind of, of every kind of bird, male and female, and to keep... Uh, uh, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I'll send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. Verse 5, you see something that was habitual of Noah. 
And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. That's what a righteous man does. Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And they brought in all those animals with them. On that very day, uh, verse 13, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Let's move down to verse 17. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains in a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out, people and animals and the creatures that move along the ground, and the birds were wiped out from the earth. Only Noah was left and all those with him on the ark in the ark. So here we're told about righteous Noah. And we're told that the ark was indeed something that really happened. Now, righteous Noah lived at this time. And what are we told about Noah and the ark? That he did everything just according to how it was planned. I find it quite amazing that Noah went through this. And he went through it, here's another way, in fact, we can imagine, by still being righteous. People living in those um, um, cramped quarters, didn't he get annoyed with anybody and say, you know, I've had enough. One animal, overboard. Or maybe one of his sons or one of his daughters in law, overboard. I've had enough with you. How come we never hear anything like that from this man? He may, must have overcome great challenges. But what do we see from this scripture? First of all, we see the patience of God. We're told in Genesis 6, when God reduced the 900 years that people used to live to about 120, that is preceded by this, this, this phrase, God's patience will not endure with man forever. So God decided, I have been patient. I have been giving you a, a chance. I have been, as the Bible calls it, long-suffering. But I will not put up with this forever. God gave the people in Noah's time, ample opportunity to repent. This preacher of righteousness was continuing to reach out, but they continued to, continue to, uh, they continued to spread the, uh, the, the uh, violence on the world and continued in their ways of wickedness. The patience of God is long. He is long-suffering, but disobedience always brings punishment and God's justice. But secondly, we see the faithfulness of, of Noah. I'll just explain so many ways in which he was faithful. Here is something he did through what we learn in scripture is the basis on which we obey. And our obedience is actually driven by faith. Abraham makes it into the Bible in Hebrews 11, in that great chapter on the in that great chapter on the heroes of faith. It says this in Hebrews 11, 7, about, about, uh, about Noah, sorry. Noah, by faith, Noah, when Noah warned, was warned about these things and warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Notice what is said there in red. By faith, Noah built an ark. Faith always pushes us to obedient action. Read throughout Hebrews 11, all the heroes of faith, 
from Abraham to Noah to Moses to, to Sarah to all the other heroes. They are people who by faith did, by faith did, by faith Noah built, by faith Abraham left and went to a place he didn't know. Why? Because he was looking ahead with the eyes of faith to a city with foundations whose maker and builder was God. By faith, we always do. Faith leads us to obedient action. But notice also something else there. In holy fear. The Bible tells us in Proverbs that to fear God is to hate sin. And that is what Noah did. He hated sin. He was right with God. So the holiness that came from that holy fear of God and the faith led him to build that ark. And through it, he saved his family. And as we'll be seeing, through his sons and his son's daughters, all populations on earth have then been populated and all places, all lands populated. We are all descendants of the survivors of that ark because all other humanity had then been destroyed. We owe our existence to the righteousness and the faith of this person. But let's see something else about how God's methods of destruction. I don't know whether you notice through what I read that what God does here is actually to reverse all the beautiful order he had created in Genesis 1 and um, the uh, six days of creation. On day three, for instance, what does God do? He separates the seas from the land. The dry land comes out, he creates a boundary between the two. The, sea, the waters he calls sea, and the earth he calls land. So God is telling us, in nature I've created natural boundaries. But since you're made in my image, your moral beings, I've also given you moral boundaries by which you must live. What does God do in order to punish the disobedient? If you break and violate God's moral boundaries, God says, you know what? I am also going to break and violate the natural boundaries. And that is what God does to destroy. So the sea then comes and inhabits and then overtakes the land. The earth came out of the sea and appeared. What happens now? Even the tallest mountains now disappear under the sea. He's reversing the blessing that he did in Genesis 1. Disobedience reverses God's blessing, turns it to a curse. What did God do? We saw when we were talking about um, uh, Genesis um, um, 1, about the order of creation. He created order, beauty, structure. God now actually reverses that and introduces chaos. Everything swarming in the sea, everything, people floating, going about, everything is destroyed. The beautiful structure we saw about God's day of creation, how he created his environment, how he filled that environment with land, with plants, with fish, with sea. All that is now destroyed. It comes into one big mess. God curses a wicked humanity by reversing the blessing that he did in Genesis 1. That is what we see here. So we need to learn as another takeaway. Yes, we respect God's natural boundaries, but since we are moral beings made in the image and likeness of God, let us never forget God wants us to honor and respect his moral boundaries, to fear him and by faith follow his commands. Genesis 8 then begins with a interesting passage. The world has now been destroyed. Only the people in the ark survive. Genesis 8.1 says this, but God remembered Noah. Now, it's not like God had forgotten. He got busy with some others. Oh, there's this guy Noah in the book. How is he doing now? Let me go and check on him. That's not what it means. God remembered Noah. What the word there means is actually God looked with favor once more to Noah. He favored him. He looked at him with favor. He smiled upon him because of everything he had done obediently. God remembers those who have walked with him in righteousness. And he was protected because of his obedience, but God looked at him with favor. And he then goes on to bless him. In verse, in chapter 9, we're given some details. First of all, we're told that God has a covenant. Secondly, we're told that God has a sign. And then we're told God has a lineage. And God actually introduces a new covenant, a new sign, a new lineage through Noah. 
And I'm just going to read some passages here and tell me if this sounds strangely familiar. So first of all, God remembers Noah. He looks at him. Everyone has been destroyed. The ark is now um, d uh, docked. Dry land is um, um, now visible. You remember he sends out the raven and the dove. And then when, when, when it doesn't come back, he knows that uh, they're able to leave the ark and they come out. The first thing God does is he blesses Noah and his sons. Genesis 9.1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, and listen to this and tell me if it sounds vaguely familiar. He said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Sound familiar? Where might you have heard that? Adam's instruction. God made Adam, Genesis 1, 26, in his image and likeness, and blessed him. Exactly the same thing happening here. And then what? Gives him the same instruction. Be fruitful and multiply and go and fill the earth. What is God telling us? The same plan of uh, um, uh, the same plan and purpose he had for the human race that he intended to fulfill through Adam has not been abandoned. He is now going to do it through the descendant of Adam, uh, who is Noah. Noah's ten generations uh, um, uh, from Adam, and go about with the same plan. He has not changed his purpose or his intention for you and I as humanity. He was going to do that through Adam's race. We know sin spoiled that through what happened in the, in the Garden of Eden. He now says, Noah, I want you now to take over this responsibility. The baton has been passed to you. Same structure. Go out and fill and replenish. Same mandate. And then same divine blessing. He begins with a blessing. God never mandates us, never tells us to go, us to go out to fulfill his work without first blessing us and equipping us. A few interesting things that are different here. First of all, God puts the fear of man in the beasts. Verse 2, the fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea that, they are given, uh, um, um, th 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 that are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So first of all, he puts the fear of man in the beasts. He then goes on to change his diet. And in verse 3, he says, you used to eat plants. You can now eat anything, including meat. And those of you who love uh, Nyamachoma, this is your biblical support. <laughs> so if anybody tells you that you're more spiritual if you're vegetarian, well, quote Genesis 9.3 for them. You can eat anything and do it with thanksgiving. Amen. Those of you who like Nyamachoma, say amen. Wow, muko wengi, eh? But God actually does that and allows him to have everything. He says, however, that don't eat anything with the lifeblood in it, still in it. And this, by the way, is uh, something that we find makes its way, something out of the ceremonial way that makes its way into the New Testament. In the Jerusalem Council, as the church was spreading from the Jews to the Gentiles, and they said, what restrictions do we put on these uh, uh, new people coming in? They said, let's not encumber them with many things. Uh, tell them to um, um, you know, be generous, to stop. Um, sexual immor immorality and abstain from uh, a meat that is strangled. So the lifeblood for God is important. And, you know, the, 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 the blood had to be drained from the animals. He then goes on to protect man and say something about the sacredness of man. Verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood by human, humans shall their blood be shed. For the image of God has, for in the image of God, has God made mankind. Again, he's reiterating his, his point there. He made Adam in the image of, of God. That would have appeared to have gone wrong, but God is not defeated. He's saying, yes, all of you survivors of, 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 of this, um, the ark, are also equally made in the image of God. And then he tells them, again in verse 7, as for you, be fruitful, increase the number, multi multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. So again, that mandate is given. We learn here that this is a God whose plans cannot be thwarted. 
cannot be defeated. Yes, it may look like things aren't going very well for God at certain points, but let us remember, he's got it all under control. When the Bible says that he is the one who declares from ancient times what is yet to come, we better believe it. When God speaks, he is actually declaring something in the future. And anything that comes out from God's mouth has actually happened, though we haven't seen it with our own physical eyes. That is why we need the eyes of faith, like, like um, um, Noah, to see that which we cannot see with our physical eyes. When God speaks it, it comes into being. What do we then see happening here? We see a new covenant. We see a covenant based on grace. And this is the covenant that God now establishes with his servant um, uh, Noah. This covenant, God says, is so important. I'm going to actually put a permanent reminder about me, or for me, for this covenant. So God says in Genesis 9, for, uh, 13, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And God covenants. He promises never again to wipe out all of humanity. Though he says, though he says, all of man's thoughts were still towards evil. Let's remember something about Noah and the survivors who came off the ark with him. Yes, they're given a new blessing. Yes, they're given the same, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the same mandate. But remember, they're still descendants of a fallen Adam and a fallen Eve. They still have sin within them. By righteousness and by faith, Abraham is over, able to overcome that. But there's still that sin na nature in them they need to deal with. I find it utterly amazing that the first thing Noah then does when he comes out of the ark is to offer a sacrifice to God. Noah, we're told, built an altar to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though, and there we're given this stark reminder, even though every inclination of the human heart is still towards evil. He even says there, evil from childhood. So God is still willing to work with us and to help us through. He's given us this covenant of blessing to make sure, th 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 this covenant of blessing and this reminder, to make sure that we actually move ahead with faith, knowing that he's going to bless us and he's never going to abandon us and that God is going to be with us until the end. So we see what happens here through Noah. God is given, giving us a new covenant, a covenant of grace based on faith. Without faith, we're told in Hebrews, it is impossible to please God. And this is the new covenant. The covenant is given a good reminder. Rainbow is not just a reminder for us. It is a reminder for God. And by God's, uh, God seeing this covenant, he rem rem um, reminds us of something. And by the way, just keep that um, in mind. We'll come back to it. There'll be some surprising thing about the rainbow towards uh, the end of uh, this message. But... You know, after, in between the morning service, um, as I was talking to, to Michael, uh, Professor Michael, who uh, shared with us early, earlier, and um, this is what we were signing, and he was saying that, um, you know, teaching about sign, and you know, some of us were talking about God, and people are doing this, and he said, it's not a straight um, kind of uh, downward movement of your hand, it's a slight curve. And you know what he said? When he heard my morning message, he said, you know what? He's the father of Kenyan Sign Language. He said, this is actually the sign of the rainbow. So when he says, God bless you, it's a God whose sign of the covenant in the heavens is a rainbow. Bless, bless is what you speak. In Africa, we bless by speaking, or as you good Africans know, also by spitting. <laughs> I've, I've been blessed by um, an elderly lady after I did something very good and she, bless, she spat on me. <laughs> so <laughs> we spit. <laughs> so God bless spit or speak, that's your choice, you. How interesting that even in sign language, the covenant of God's rainbow comes through. What an amazing God we serve. So, 
we move on then from this God who has covenanted never to destroy us. This God who is blessing us and telling us to go and fulfill this mandate that never happened. God gives us a sign, but he gives us something else. The people who come out of this ark are a new generation. It's a new survivor human race. And God wants us to then make a choice. Remember, there's that sin nature. And we now have a choice to decide which way are we going to go. Are we going to go the way of rebellion? And we'll be reading um, next week when you talk about uh, Nimrod, whose name means rebellion in Genesis 10. Or are we going to go the way of redemption? Where one blood and we have two races. Those who are following the way of rebellion and running that race. And those who are following the uh, the, the race that are following the way of redemption. This way of redemption comes through what Christ did on the cross. Everything God cursed is made right on the cross. And those people who are going this way of rebellion are doing things their way. God then does something interesting with this family of Noah. And here we learn something else about how Noah actually was not only a righteous man, but also a very human man. We're told that Noah then planted a vineyard. He was a farmer. He harvested some grapes. He probably saw, um, left some grapes in the corner somewhere, and they fermented, and he made some juice out of it. He just didn't know that that was not grape juice. It was actually wine. <laughs> so maybe he had been used to drinking um, grape juice and took a bit of the same portion, and he, this, because this was actually wine, it made him drunk. We have in Genesis 9, then, a story that shows us the humanity of this man. That he then became drunk and lay exposed in his tent. And then his son walks in and looks upon him. And first of all, I say, my goodness, ah, oh, a righteous man. How did this appear in the Bible? Who's doing the editing? You know, how did this get through? Didn't anybody spot this and cut it out? If I was editing, I would never have allowed that to come through. It's one of the things that shows us this is God's word. These people can be righteous and come to the highest points in the mountain, but they also have their human flaws. Now here, where we talk about our final point, about God's new lineage, and about this new lineage of God, which is the righteous lineage, those who are rescued, we learn about the three sons of Ham. And it is through those three sons and their wives that all of us now descended. Ham looks at his father's nakedness. And the word there in Hebrew is actually much stronger. It says he gazed at and then gossiped. So he gazed at, and this was an honor-shame culture where that was not meant to happen. And then he goes and gossips about it to his brothers. His brothers, Shem and, and uh, Japheth, hear this, and they take a garment and walk in backwards. They wouldn't dare look at their father in that state and then covered him. When Abraham hears that, he then goes on to pronounce a curse. Although we are not sure it's not clear in this scripture that these things were immediately happening one after the other. There could have been time in between. But interestingly, we're told something here that actually helps banish a myth that many of us might have heard. And this is a myth. We're told from this passage by some people that there is a curse of Ham. Anybody heard about it? And that we, Africans, are descendants of Ham. We're Hamites. And because of whatever happened there, that the Hamites have been cursed with the Ham, uh, curse of Ham. Anybody heard about that? This has unfortunately been used as a justification for apartheid in South Africa, as a, as a justification for the slave trade. After all, you're cursed. And there's mention there about slavery. So let's just look at this lineage and see what the Bible actually says about this curse of Ham. And let's look at that passage in Genesis. And this is Genesis chapter 9. When Noah awoke, uh, verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be who? Canaan. So those of you who talk about the curse of Ham, please show me that scripture and that Bible verse. I'd like to see it. A curse of Ham, my friends, is fake news. <laughs> There's no curse of Ham. There's a curse of Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, may Canaan be the slaves of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. 
May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. No curse of Ham. Let's put that to bed. So, don't believe that lie. It doesn't exist anywhere. But you may ask a question. Hang on. Why is the grandson punished for the, 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 the sin of the father? Canaan was punished. Here we need to understand what is going on here. That cursing and blessing by the family patriarch in the Bible used to happen. A good example would be in um, Genesis chapter 49. When Jacob assembles his sons before him and he says, let me now, he says, come and assemble before me so that I may bless you. And he says, so that I may bless you and tell you what things will be. So he looks at the personality of each child and says, based on your personality, based on how I know you and everything I've seen, I can tell you these are the kind of fruits it's going to yield. And he declares that and his speaking then became destiny for that person. But he wasn't just saying, you I curse, you I bless. That's not what he was doing. He was looking at that person. So he looks at Reuben and says, because he had uh, um, committed some, some, some sin, he said, you are my firstborn, but you will no longer excel. He looks at his sons, Levi and Simeon, and said, your swords are swords of violence. And then he also pronounces something on them. At the end of the blessing of all his sons, he says, after this, uh, uh, J- uh, Jacob blessed them, and after giving them a blessing according to the portion or according to what was appropriate to each of them. So all this, that is happening here, no one looks at Canaan. And he had probably, probably been observing him over a period of time. He says, Canaan, I can see something in you. I can see some traits within you. This is what it is going to lead to. The Canaanites, as we are told, are the people then who went and the Jebusites and the uh, Hittites are the people who then occupied the lands that the Israelites then came and took over and possessed. They were the ones who had evil practices in cities like Jericho. And they're the people that the Israelites came and were wiped out of the land. But God has not pronounced a curse on Ham. Ham and the Hamites then, actually Ham actually had other sons after that. And he was the father of Cush. Cush became um, um, the, the father of the Egyptians, of the Libyans, of the Babylonians. And these are all great civilizations. And the, 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 the Kushites then moved sm- um, south, further south, including into East Africa. And by the way, we'll be learning more about the populations and the way they move to different um, nations around the world next, next week. But just to make, make this clear, we need to understand exactly what the scripture says. And many of these became great civilizations that were blessed and even had a place, a big place in the Bible narrative. As we bring this to an end, I just want us to look at something else that is not apparent from this narrative in Genesis. We've got to look forward. And as I said, Genesis mirrors very closely what happens in the rest of scripture, but also particularly, especially the early parts of Genesis, what happens in the book of Revelation. In Genesis, we see the beginning. In Revelation, we see the ending. We're told something very interesting in the book of Genesis about this big bow that God sets in the cloud, that this is a reminder for him. Do you know what? This rainbow comes up again, once again in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, John is taken up in the spirit by the angel. And he says, the angel says, come, let me show you what it's going to be. And the angel um, looks at him and says, I was, uh, uh, John says, I was in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. He then goes on to describe the radiance of that throne. It then, he, sa- he then says, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne of God. John is telling us the same symbol he put around the earth, to remind him of his covenant, is the same symbol that encircles. And here, it's not just in the sky, it goes entirely around the throne of God. What an awesome reminder that God has a permanent reminder in front of his throne, surrounding his throne, of his mercy, of his grace, of his new covenant. Never again is he going to wipe us out. Never again is he going to destroy this world like he did at the the flood of Noah. He has surrounded himself with a constant reminder. He wants us now to respond to him by grace. And we decide now ourselves, which of the two races are we going to join? The rebellious race, disagreeing with God and continuing in sin, or the redeemed and the rescued race that comes through the redemption bought on the cross through Christ. Isaiah says something wonderful. 
as he refers to this promise of God. He says this, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. This God who's compassionate, who's gracious, who's merciful, says his covenant of peace with us, with mercy, his covenant of grace, established through Noah, and which we are all her, um, uh, beneficiaries of, is never going to be removed. It's easier for the mountains to be removed than that to be done away with. This is the God we worship. So my friends, we need to decide which race are we going to run? Which race are we going to be a member of? The redeemed race through Christ by faith, or the rebellious race that continues to do evil and fill the world with wickedness. Let us be people who accept the blessing and the redemption that Noah and his righteousness bought for us. And let us be people who through our generations and through Noah because he saved and blessed his family, through our generations also bequeath to those coming after us this gift of righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Let us stand up and pray. Let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word to us. I thank you, Father, that your redemption reaches as far as our sin. It reaches and redeems the curse as far as the curse was found. Thank you, Father, for the cross of Christ. You tell us in your word that cursed is the man or anyone who hangs on the tree. And we know, Father, that Christ became a curse so that we who are under a curse could inherit a blessing. Thank you for the, the way, Father, in which you have blessed us and given us a new mandate. You first bless us and then tell us once again to go out and fill the earth with your goodness and your blessing. And so I pray that you may be blessed. God, truly bless your people. May God protect you and enlarge your tents. May he strengthen the bars of your gates. May he protect you, bless the work of your hands, protect you, your household, and all that is yours. May your sons in their youth be like full-grown plants and your daughters like corner pillars out of the structure of a king's palace. May your granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce for you. May your sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in your fields. May your cattle be heavy with young, and may they suffer no mishap or failure as they bear their young. May there be no cry of distress in your streets. Blessed, happy, prosperous are the people to whom such blessings fall. And blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And so, Father, since we are your children, since we are people who follow you, I pray that each and every one of us would then run this race steadily. Therefore, let us, all of us, seeing that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily encompass us. And let us run with perseverance. Let us run with patience. The race set out before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.